Have you ever taken a road trip, gotten in the car, checked the fuel gauge, reckon, yep, just enough petrol to where I'm going to, or diesel, whatever you prefer. And so you get in the car and off you go and you, you go past the petrol stations and you reckon, ah, don't need to fill up, I've got enough, I know this road, I know this distance, and I know how much my car consumes. We're sweet, we're gonna get from point A to point B without a trouble in the world because we have enough petrol to go the distance on the journey. Anyway, a good few kilometers into the, the drive, you find yourself in a situation where either you got yourself lost and have done a turnaround and you, and you use more petrol than you thought you should have, or perhaps you come up on a scene where there's a detour because maybe there's been an accident in the road ahead. And in the process, you begin to realize because of the extra distance, because we got lost or because we had to take a detour, suddenly you're seeing that needle, that little petrol gauge drop, drop, drop below the quarter, starting to touch the red. Maybe you don't know the road, or maybe you know the road and there are no petrol stations between here and the end of the journey, and you realize you are in a whole lot of trouble because you are gonna run out of gas. Jesus used an analogy in scripture, a parable, something that was in fact so much more than a story, but really an object lesson about life and about spiritual things. And the lesson was much the same as the scenario I've just laid out for you with petrol, except the analogy that he uses is oil. He speaks about a wedding feast, and the story is found in Matthew chapter 25. He speaks about a wedding party going to the wedding reception. And of course, there are 10 virgins who are supposed to light the way. They have lamps. Lamps produce fire, which produce light, and they burn oil in those days, right? And so as these people, the bridal party, are, are, are going ahead of the groom and his bride to the celebration venue, there's some kind of delay. The journey gets longer than expected. The sun goes down, it gets dark outside, which is just as well they have the light, right? Except that when the cry comes out, behold, the bridegroom comes, behold, the bride and the bridegroom, they're on their way, they're arriving, come, let's get ready. When the cry goes out and they wake up, they've fallen asleep, they're drowsy, five of them realize that they don't have enough oil in their lamps. And so their calculation of oil wasn't correct and their light has gone out. There are another five who slept with those other five, right? They have, they've all fallen asleep, but they had extra oil in their lamps. When they wake up, they're able to light their lamps and keep going. Their lamps, in fact, never went out. And so the ones who have run out of oil naturally come to the ones with oil and they say to them, hey, have you got some oil you can lend to us? But those wise virgins, those ones who planned for extra, they say to them, unfortunately, we don't have that much extra. You're going to have to go into town. You're going to have to find the, the, um, find the lamp dealers and you're going to have to buy more oil. Well, as the story goes, as Jesus tells it, by the time those five foolish virgins, those unprepared virgins, come back, into t back to where the, the bridal party is, the door is closed, the celebration is underway, they knock on the door, but the bridegroom says to them, who are you? I don't know who you are. You'll have to stay out. They weren't there when the doors were open and now the doors are closed and no one gets in anymore. Now this story, of course, comes in a particular context. That context is Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, as we've already unpacked in a previous discussion on more than a story, in Matthew 24, we have this explanation, this question of, you know, what will be the signs of the end of the world? And so the disciples are puzzling over the fall of Jerusalem there, that Jesus predicted. They're puzzling over the end of the age and the dawning of the great kingdom and its final glory. And so Matthew 24 goes through the signs and the urgency of the times. Jesus has a lot to say in there. He uses the parable of the fig tree that begins to bud. And he says, you know what, when you see that sign in the natural world, you know that the season of resurrection, you know that spring is around the corner. And then he likens this in the spiritual sense to seeing certain signs and things unfold in, our, in the world around us of a moral and spiritual nature in the political world and the natural world that tell us that the earth is getting old, that the end of the age is coming and the dawning of the new eternal age, the, the age of the kingdom of God is about to be here. 
And then he switches gears after talking about these signs and after, after saying numerous times that, that we need to be ready, that the times are urgent, that we dare not take our eyes off the prize, so to speak, that we must of necessity keep our hearts tuned into the frequency of heaven, that we may be in communion with heaven, in communion with God at all times because the time is short and times are urgent. Then he tells the story of the ten virgins, five wise, five prepared, five foolish, five unprepared. You know what, when you think about this story, you realize that the five foolish virgins are not hypocrites, right? They are not hypocrites. They are there. They are part of this thing that's happening. They want to be there. The only problem is they didn't have enough oil. They're not masquerading as something that they're not, which is the definition of hypocrisy, right? You know, when you and I make out like we're religious, make out like we're citizens of the kingdom of God, we speak the right words, but we don't live the right life. This is not them. These people are genuine. These, these foolish virgins, these unprepared virgins, are, are heart and soul there with the others. So what is Jesus saying here in the context of the last days and urgency and this idea that the wedding supper is, is prepared? Well, we know that this is a metaphor used through Scripture. We find it even in Revelation chapter 19, this idea that, that the, the final coming of the kingdom is described as a wedding supper. And we are invited into that wedding supper. And it means that we are part of the kingdom of God. So I think that what Jesus is pointing forward to here is he's, he's giving us a parable pertaining to the last days. He's giving us a parable in the context of Matthew 24, in the context of the metaphor of the marriage supper, right? He's giving us a parable that should be understood to be a message, a message of urgency, a message of warning pertaining to those living just prior to the coming of Jesus in the final lead up of events to the arrival of Jesus and the glorious kingdom. In other words, I think that this is a parable that you and I need to pay special attention to because it's speaking to our generation and our time. Now we notice here, of course, in Matthew chapter 25, that it says here that these 10 virgins took their 10 lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were prudent, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. They had made preparation for delay. One of the things that comes out of this parable is the, the answer to the question or the allegation or maybe even the mockery that you've heard. That we've heard these things for years, for ages. My grandparents, my great-grandparents, right down to the early disciples, they all thought Jesus was coming soon. So if they were wrong, then we're probably wrong and we have lots of time ahead of us. This parable, one of the things it does is it actually tells us there will be a delay. It actually tells us that the passing of time between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming would seem to be shorter than it actually ends up becoming. It's like us getting in the car, going from point A to point B, thinking we're going in a straight line, taking the main highway, but then for whatever reason having to go on a detour and a roundabout. It's a longer distance and it's a longer amount of time and it requires resources, in this case, the oil for the burning of the lamps. So do not be discouraged and do, do not be disheartened when you think to yourself, is it going to happen? I mean, with all the delay, with the seeming, this whole thing taking longer than, than generations before me thought it would. And so, so what, why would I think that it might actually happen in my lifetime? Don't be discouraged with those thoughts of doubt. When Jesus himself said to us, expect the delay, prepare for the delay, Live as those in the midst of delay who are ready, though, at any moment. Because when that day comes, it will actually come to those who are living in a frame of mind where delay has become the norm and they have gone to sleep. And so maybe that is us. Maybe that is our time where we've become so accustomed to delay that we live with an attitude of delay. That means we're not preparing and we're not ready and we're not focused on what's about to happen. So do not be discouraged and do not be dismayed. The prophecy, the, 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 the teaching of this parable highlights the element of delay and it says to us, be ready with oil, be ready with the lamp because it will happen and when it happens, it will be quick. So that begs the question, 
that begs the question, what are these lamps? Who are these virgins? We know about delay. We know about the, 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 the wedding supper. But what is the symbolism in here? Well, I think number one, when you go to Zechariah chapter three, you actually realize that according to the Old Testament, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus calls himself the light of the world. And we know that uh, the book of Psalms calls, uh, uses the, the metaphor of light to refer to the word of God. And of course, that makes sense because Jesus is the incarnate word of God. John chapter one, verses one to three, right? Jesus, who is the light of this world, is his story, his life, his message is captured in this book, the Bible, which the book of Psalms calls a lamp unto my feet that I may see where I'm going in a dark world. Now, the lamps in those days were not battery powered. They were oil driven. So if the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the light is a symbol of Jesus as, as reflected or as spoken of in his word, then what you have here is a combination of the Holy Spirit of God and the salvation of Jesus Christ as taught in the word and through the word that's brought alive in our experience by the holy spirit is the source of our preparation to be ready for the marriage supper that you and i are invited to attend however in the time of delay when people became accustomed become accustomed to you know saying peace and safety and there's plenty of time when that when that day finally comes there's a group of christians who have been sincere who have been part of the journey who are found to be unprepared. What, what is the nature of this unpreparedness? Well, I think if the Holy Spirit is the oil, and if the Word of God and Jesus Christ is the light, then it seems to me that running out of the oil means that they are accustomed to the teachings of the Word. They have the light of God's Word in their possession. They know the doctrines of truth. They know the promises of the Word of God. They know the conditions of salvation. They know the warnings of Scripture. Their problem isn't with the knowledge that is light. The problem is with that knowledge becoming a living reality through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see, I think what this parable is highlighting is that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit will always be demonstrated or evidenced by the outflowing of love of practical Christian living. It is not enough to merely know the truths, the abstract truths, the doctrinal truths of the Word of God. It is not enough to simply be able to quote the promises or give the answers in a pop quiz on Bible subjects. Knowing, knowing about the gospel is not the same as experiencing the gospel. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as being in fellowship with Jesus. That experience of the gospel, that experience of being in fellowship with Jesus is facilitated, made real by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. What you and I need to be praying for in this time of preparation, what we need to be seeking for is more than only a knowledge of God's Word. The knowledge of God's Word is the gateway that opens our hearts to Jesus that we might receive him. It opens our minds to enter into conversation and the confession of our sin. You see, the forgiveness of sin is one aspect of salvation, but then the grace that forgives us is also the grace that transforms us. The Holy Spirit that leads us to repentance is also the Holy Spirit that renews us from the inside out and transforms our heart. And in the language of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, creates us to be a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. You and I need more than a theoretical knowledge of truth. We need more than a propositional understanding of truth. We need living truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 verse 6, right? If He is the way, the truth, and the life, then for you, to, for you and I to have life, we must have Jesus. Not just a knowledge about Jesus, not just the ability to quote Jesus and His sayings, but to have a heart that is truly entered into fellowship, that is truly entered into the experience of surrender, that is having the Holy Spirit shape and mold us and bringing new things out from within us. Because true salvation, friend, 
True salvation is not external religion trying to change the heart. It is the internal heart experience being renewed that then leads to external change. It's not enough to simply know the truths of God's Word, to proclaim God's Word. Now, as evidence of this, I want to take you also in Matthew to chapter 7, verse 22. Notice what it says here. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Think about that for a moment. What a sobering teaching from Jesus. A very similar situation to what we find in the parable of the wedding feast, right? And the, and the wise and the foolish virgins. This idea that when the door closes, there will be some who knock on the door to say, hey, but we're part of this party. We're part of your number. And he says, I don't know who you are. You're not prepared. You're not ready for this. And I want you to notice that in Matthew chapter 7, I believe Jesus is actually talking particularly, not to the world at large, but to a group of believers who believe that they are walking with Him, who believe that they, are, they, are, that they know Him. And how do I know that? Because listen to the characteristics, what they claim as the evidence, right, that they are of His party. It says here, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name? That means that maybe they exercised the gift of prophecy or maybe they preached the prophetic message. It says, in your name we cast out demons. I mean, what greater evidence could there be than that, right? To be casting out demons. Surely that is a symbol that we are, are, are amongst the saved. It says, in your name did we not perform many miracles. In other words, the reason I think this is a group of believers or Christians, if you like, is because they're actually claiming to have manifested the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of those things mentioned there are in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 12. They are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, preaching, teaching, gifts of miracles and of healings and of tongues and of all sorts of things, administrations and helps and so on and so forth, right? They were doing all those things. They were involved in Christian service. They, 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 were, they thought they were walking in the Spirit. And then Jesus says something profound. The real evidence that you are a part of my kingdom, that you are a part of my wedding party, that you are welcome for eternity in my house. The real evidence are not the amazing things you think you've done, the ways in which you have conquered the, the, the forces of darkness. He says the real evidences that you are my children, it's found in character. Matthew 7 verse 23, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They were living in sin. They were living as breakers of God's Ten Commandments. They were Christians who were not saved from their sins, but claimed salvation while remaining in their sins. You understand how that can work, right? We, 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 we confess our sins, but we do so in a way where there's no true sorrow for sin, no desire to separate from the selfishness of our heart. We simply desire to escape the consequence of sin, you know, eternal destruction and death and all of that, that terrible stuff, right? So, so out of self-preservationistic um, intentions to save ourselves, we, we claim to have given Jesus our sin, but our daily life the, the things we cherish in our heart, the attitudes, the actions that flow out of that, all of that demonstrates that we are still bound to that selfish way of living, to that sinful way of living. And Jesus says, you might have had church fellowship. You might even know the Word of God in theory. Hey, you might have even prophesied the Word of God, taught the Word of God. You may have come up against the forces of darkness. There may have been moments in ministry where the power of God even really flowed through you and God used you. But you know what? When I look at your character, God says, when I look not at the gifts of the Spirit and the exercise of abilities and so on, but when I look at, when I look at, the, at the heart, when I look at the fruits of the Spirit, I find that you are not in harmony with the Spirit of heaven. To take you with me to heaven would be torture to your soul. To live in that environment of selflessness to you would be, you, you, would, you would feel like a, a square peg in a round hole, right? You, you wouldn't actually 
gel in this environment. The reason I believe that anybody will be excluded from heaven is not because God is arbitrary, not because he has favorites, not because he's vindictive in any way, and certainly not because he's trying to catch us out in the judgment. No, I believe the only reason that God will not take us with, us, with him to heaven is because he knows in his wisdom by what we've cherished in this world, the principles that move us to action, right? That the, that, that the principle that we still cherish is self-seeking. And in the atmosphere of heaven, we would be completely out of place. Not only out of place to everybody else around us, but we would not enjoy that company. We would not enjoy that environment. We would not enjoy living under that rule of law. And so the exclusion from the kingdom one day for some is not simply an act of judgment like God says, I don't want to be around you. It is in essence an act of mercy saying, I realize that you will never find eternal happiness in this place. And so it's better if we part ways. You see, the sobering reality of this parable, the sobering reality of this parable, it is this idea that there are many amongst us who claim the Bible teachings, who claim salvation, who might be with us in church fellowship. And hey, this parable isn't told so that we can point the finger and judge others. Maybe we are the, that one who we know the theory of truth. We know the doctrine of truth, but we don't know the one who is truth. Remember the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Salvation is not a theoretical ascent to a body of belief and doctrine. Salvation is a living, walking, talking, daily relationship of surrender and of dependence and of humility and of empowering and of transformation that ex is experienced as the Holy Spirit works in us and through us. Through the Word of God, He raises the topics that reveal our heart, that cause us to bring it to Him in confession and then invite the Holy Spirit in to do His work of transformation in us. No, you cannot make yourself a citizen of the kingdom of God. You can only avail yourself of the kingdom of God. You cannot produce the fruit of righteousness. You can only let Him produce the fruit of righteousness in you. The part you play is the exercise of your choice. It is the exercise of the will to hear the Word of God, to submit to the world, Word of God, to confess our ugliness and our out of harmoniness, if there is such a word, with the character of Christ, and then to invite Him in. If all, if all we do is hold Him at arm's length while we learn truth from Him, we are not saved. The story here is that these women, these virgins, right, representing, and we know that in the Bible, in Bible prophecy and throughout Scripture, women in Bible prophecy and Bible teaching represent a church, right, or people who make up the body of Christ. And so, and so you have this idea here that they are virgins, meaning that they have a pure faith. They know the Word of God because they have light. And they've had an early experience because the light is, is with the Holy Spirit. But they don't maintain that experience through the period of delay. They become distracted. In the language of the parable, they become drowsy and sleepy. And I want you to notice this. All of them are like that. In other, one, in other words, there is no group of people, no individual near the end of time who has an absolutely perfect walk, an absolutely perfect record with the Lord in the lead up to the soon return. All of them are drowsy. All of them are distracted. All of them slumber and sleep. But some of them have gained an experience, a preparation, an infilling of the Spirit that stands them in good stead despite the delay to be ready at the time of coming, to be ready with Jesus. Now, one thing I don't want this parable to be understood to be teaching is that somehow you and I cannot, cannot have assurance of our salvation. That somehow you and I cannot know that we are saved by the grace and the mercy of Jesus. The hallmark, the hallmark of those who are ready to meet Jesus, the hallmark is that they, are not, they not only have an intellectual understanding of the truth, but they have a heart surrender experience. So I ask you, are you living outwardly? Are you living as one redeemed from self? 
Are you living as one who is given to the service of the kingdom of God, given to the service and the upbuilding of humanity? Are you living generously? Are you living in obedience to the commandments of God? And I know that the answer for that to, to that for all of us is not perfectly for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But is the orientation of your heart and the love of your heart towards God and towards obedience such that when you realize you have transgressed, it grieves you. It might even upset you because you know that this is not the character of God and you, you, are, you are troubled by the way in which you are different to the character of God, fallen compared to the character of God. You remember David in the Old Testament, right? This great man after God's own heart, as the Bible calls him, the friend of God. Well, do you recall the incredible lapse that he experienced? The way in which he committed premeditated first degree murder of a man who was a loyal uh, man of, of, of the army, who defended the kingdom of Israel, who, who was a close friend of David. And he had to commit this premeditated murder because this man, Uriah, had more honor than David had because David had slept with his wife, brought Uriah home from the battlefield, told him to go home and have a night with his wife so that he could hopefully cover up his sin in sleeping with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. But when Uriah showed more dignity, more kingly nobility of character than David did by saying, how can I go home and relax and take my ease when my men are on the battlefield dying right now? I will not do this. He slept at the gates of the palace and went the next day. Eventually, David decided the only way to cover his sin was to have Uriah murdered. This is the man who is a man after God's own heart. This was the friend of God. And I tell you and remind you of this story because you and I are like David. David had a genuine experience with the Lord. But when he took his eyes off of the Lord, all the ugliness of the human heart came back up. You see, there is a struggle within each of us. It is the struggle of the sinful, selfish nature versus the nature of Jesus, which is being implanted in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And whenever you and I, whenever you are and I are not active in this battle, keeping our eyes on Jesus, when we sleep and slumber, the risk we take is that that old carnal nature will arise, come to the fore again, and lead us into sin we thought we had left behind a hundred years ago. And so as the story goes, God calls David a man after his own heart, not because of the sin that he committed, but because when the message of the word came to him and he came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he did not harden his heart. When Nathan said to him, you are this man, you are the man that deserves death. When he did not harden his heart, but fell before God in repentance, he was restored to the favor of God. You see, what makes us, what makes us the children of God, beloved by God, is not that we are sinless and perfect, but that our hearts are soft and available to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. That when the Word of God comes to us like it came to David, as I say, no self-justifying, no blame shifting, no excusing, but he acknowledged his sin before God and was made whole through the forgiveness of God. He then lived the ongoing life of repentance from that point going forward. You see, what God is looking for in those who are ready to meet Him as the last generation is not sinless perfection per se. It is an experience with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that leads to transformation of heart and life. There is real change. There is a reorienting towards righteousness. There is a new love of God's commandments. We desire to be obedient to Him. And yet when we are not, when we do fail, we are quick in repentance because that is the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We, the, the, the biggest change in our life will be seen in our relationships with others, in our practical life in this world. It's not just a theory of the truth, but we now begin to move towards others. We begin to serve and love. We invest our time, our talents, our resources in, in preparing the way. It is with our, with our words of truth and our deeds of holiness that this perfect message is seen by a world that needs to be led to repentance. The world doesn't need a lot of smart mouths telling them good and true things while we live in a way that is contrary to the message we claim to be true. No, our lives and the way we live and the way we conduct our relationships 
the way we deal with other people in this world on a horizontal level is a manifestation of our true relationship or quality of relationship with God in heaven. The vertical always transposes to the horizontal. And those who are the wise virgins are those who are filled with the Spirit, with the Word of God, their lives and their words bearing testimony to the kingdom of God. And one day when that delay is over, when that proclamation goes out, behold, behold, the bridegroom comes, they are ready. You know why they're ready for heaven? They're ready for heaven because heaven has already been implanted in their hearts. They're ready for the fellowship of Jesus face to face because they already have fellowship with Jesus now through the presence of the Holy Spirit. You see, those who are ready to welcome the bridegroom are those who have already welcomed him in heart down here. So that eventually what we find is a snapshot in the book of Revelation chapter 19, a picture of the coming of Jesus, just like the, this idea of the wedding supper, right? It says here, speaking of the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation 19 from verse 7 and onwards, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, and bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints." And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Did you get that? The Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. The promise of the coming of, the coming of Jesus is a guarantee. It is a done deal. The price has already been paid upon the cross. And so why would God not ultimately fulfill that for which He has already paid the infinite price. There is no doubt about the coming of Jesus. My challenge to you today, my challenge to you today, is that you would do more than fortify the mind with the Word of God. That you would humble your heart before God. That you would invite the Holy Spirit, the oil of God, to take that Word which you're storing in your mind and move it from the head knowledge down to the heart where it changes, transforms the very core of your being, your relational loyalties, your, your spiritual allegiance, where it changes attitudes, where it changes the internal workings, the affections of the heart, and then it shows itself in a practical life of transformation. You know who are the group who are ready when the Lord comes? Those who don't simply know the truth, but are living examples of the truth. Having been justified by the blood of Jesus, they are then sanctified by that same grace of Jesus, so that when, they, when Jesus returns and the marriage supper is announced, they are then glorified with Jesus in that final supper. That is the journey of our salvation. That is the direction that history is moving towards, and it is just on the horizon. So I encourage you with a message of urgency and I encourage you with an appeal to let the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, to, 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 to let go of those cherished idols and those cherished sins, that cherished selfishness that comes so natural to us and begin to live the life of the future kingdom today by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the living Word of God. May that be your experience as we joyfully anticipate the greatest event yet to happen on this planet, the coming of Jesus and the final victory for all those who are living by the grace of God today. Let me pray with you. Lord God Almighty, may we be ready for that day. We hear your warning and we also see your promise. We invite the Holy Spirit to take hold of our hearts to move the knowledge of the Word from our minds down into our hearts, that our affections for you would be genuine, that our love for humanity would be tangible, that our lives would be transformed and our relationships revamped, all because your grace flows not only into us, but out of us to others. May we be ready on the day that you return, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.